Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Tony Sias, president and CEO of Caramu House, America's oldest African-American theater, celebrating 102 years. Uh, it's my honor to welcome Clap Back, the poetry of Tahimba Jest, Unplugged. But before we go any further, we want to thank the Cleveland Foundation, Annisville Book Award, and Karen Long and Stephanie Thompson for being such great partners in producing this evening's event. This evening is, yes. And Karen is right here in the second row, and today is a very special day. Today is her birthday. So on three, we're gonna say happy birthday, Karen. One, two, three, happy birthday, Karen. Yes. We're also honored to have another Annisville Book Award recipient here this evening, Karan Mahajan. Karan? There you go. So this is my shameless plug on behalf of Caramu. We open our 101st season on next Thursday evening with a show called Simply Simone, the life and music of Nina Simone. We have four incredible actresses who will take on the life and the music of Nina. We want all of you to go out and get your tickets immediately coupled with buying a season subscription. So it's important that you come here and celebrate the work here at Caramu. And it's the last production that will be in this space before we then go under renovation. So we're going under a $1.8 million renovation in this space. So in June, the space will reopen with a brand new theater, brand new lights, brand new stage, brand new me. <laughs> So at this point, I want to welcome to the stage a scholar, a gentleman, my friend, and the executive director of 12 Literary and Performative Arts Incubator, Mr. Daniel Gray Kantar. Greetings, everybody all right? We're gonna try that one more again. We all woke up this morning, right? And we all woke up knowing that our homes weren't going to be blown away by a hurricane, right? Yeah. So we're going to try that one more time. Y'all all right? Yeah. That's what we want. Greetings. My name is Daniel Gray Kantar, Executive Artistic Director for 12 Literary Arts. And I want to welcome uh, each and every one of you for being here uh, this evening. I have some notes here that I want to pull up, make sure I get everything. So on behalf of all of the partners who have worked together to make tonight possible, I want to thank you for being a part of this moment where we celebrate the poetry of Tai Hemba Jess and honor the black literary tradition from which he has emerged. Although Tai Hemba's credits as a man of letters is widely celebrated worldwide, lesser known are his contributions to the craft of pedagogy. It is in this respect that we shine light on Tai Hemba's efforts at teaching the next school of Pulitzer Prize winners and Annisfield Wolf Award recipients by opening our evening with two of Cleveland's poets on the verge. I'd like to introduce them first and then have them come out onto the stage. Our first poet is Mary Barrett. Mary is an 18-year-old dancer, poet, lecturer, and essayist. She has performed all over Cleveland, and her poetry merges critical race theory, feminist theory, hip-hop cultural studies with spoken word aesthetics. She has lectured at The Ohio State University Hip-Hop Literacies Conference about literature and social justice, and as an intern at 12 Literary Arts, she teaches poetry and writing to middle and high school students. Mary graduated from the Cleveland School of the Arts last year as one of the top five students in her class with a 4.5 GPA. Mary is currently taking a gap year, and she has decided to remain here in Cleveland and will pick up her studies at Cleveland State University next year. Performing her poem, Black Words, please bring to the stage Miss Mary Barrett.
dressed in Bakongo beats. Bouncing off the rivers we've come to know, we flow with Congo and Nile. Our souls have grown deep like the rivers. Moon pits guiding ties, the Aribada is electric. Calling for Orisha's Badu or summoning Amenaza, dark magic like the portal separating St. Clair from MLK University Circle. Spitting a universe in circles. On loop, even when shit hits the fan, we know how to resist the flow. I learned in 12 bricks, breaking vocal cords, sore throats. Hard not to lose your voice in the midst of Cleveland. Hard to find your voice in the midst of Cleveland. Hard not to mimic someone else's voice and mistake it for yours in the midst of Cleveland. In chaos, that's the realness, the illness. Cleveland always got the flu. Even in the summertime blues, clueless caress of mama nature under stress. Cleveland, the only place where you experience four seasons in 24 hours, where brothers stay salty all winter, yet there's still all this ice on these streets. Where construction fixes over white smiles and skips over frowns, claiming we couldn't be seen with our hoods over our heads. That's the hood up ahead. Thank the Lord for the freeways protecting Brat and all. It ain't never been this cold in the homeland. Boxes burning, pants drop tops when blood rain drops bodies, bow our heads dangling locks. The block is hot with cops and bars, we spit in rhymes, punch and bag, beat box and matches, roll in the bag to think outside the box, striking you with lightning and blunt statements, dark basements housing trap hoods and black hood raps rapping and getting wrapped up in snake traps, taking long naps, combing long naps, light skinned Negro head, heard there were stories in them roots deep like Zulu. Africa Bambada and his psychedelic, psychic-powered sidekick and back and spinning voodoo. Oxy cleaning out the oxycodon, conning out the constructs of our minds, freeing our minds, spilling police fines, blacks doing police time. Police doing their job backwards, I mean backwards. Cause they can't stand hearing us speak black words, I mean unitary backwards, back towards them. Black warrants and white wardens. The hood is on fire. We're in fire. Nations twisted matrix. Sequence coding for Negro bio or Negro geo. Gaia, rename your earth. Turn back the clock to 12. Bricks, block portals, segregated poems. Loop the track and slow it down to Cleveland on fire. Submerge yourself in water and heal. Cleveland in water. Ground yourself to this earth and meditate. Cleveland on earth. This is not our hell. For there are four seasons, four elements in four directions, north, south, east, and west, and we all integrate into 12 poems for Cleveland. Thank you. Our second poet, Damien McClendon, is a 25-year-old poet and visual artist based here in the 216. Damien's pronouns are he, him, and his. Damien started performing poetry in 2015 in Poetry Slam, and he has since shared his talents on stages across the country. Damien's work captures the black experience with an honesty that is driven by love and compassion for all humanity. Every time he sits down to craft a poem or perform on stage, he is committing an act of love, honoring his people, fighting for and feeding us in the same breath while simultaneously attempting to give back all the love that's been given to him. Tonight, Damien will perform a short work. Well, he was going to perform a work called Black Child, but he's gonna perform something a little different. Please give it up for Mr. Damien McClendon. Love? Slaves don't fall in love. But then we were never slaves to begin with. 
We were always people whose hearts were the closest thing we had to home, so we gave them to each other. Because inhumanity will never scar the most human thing about us. How tomorrow can look us directly in our eyes and not recognize our faces. Today, my arms are full of you. Resting beneath the adolescence of a poplar tree, we are two oceans away from everything trying to kill us, kissing apocalypse in the mouth. For a moment, we escape. Our skin, just enough earth to hide underground, we surrender. Every bone in our bodies of water to the fire and the wind guides our ashes to freedom. They will never find us here or anywhere that requires a body. Our present becomes the next lifetime we said we'd find each other in. We kiss in 400 year cycles like we never really owned our lips before. Hold each other like no one is coming to kill us. Bend our breaking bones into shelter. Turn our suffering into floorboards to prove pain won't keep us from holding stuff down. We stand a monument dedicated to eternity. Anywhere our lives don't matter, we must learn to love more than the life of each other must open our hearts to the ghosts that become us. Our lovers must know what war can do to these bonds and choose to love anyway. Master, military strategist, and still foolish enough to fall in love with a casualty. We pray bullets never get as close to our lovers as we have, never touch them in ways we haven't. Our worst fear are bullets falling in love, firearms reaching into chest cavity, guns make the most jealous lovers, will make it so that you never feel anything for anyone again. And ain't that like power, to kill you and call it compassion, to have never known love in the first place and believe everyone else is as incapable as them, slaves don't fall in love said the white supremacist to what he thought was a black person but was really just a mirror and we were always people whose love had the power can keep a name alive long after a body has gone tomorrow doesn't recognize our face because we gave birth to it it is our baby and we make sure we are there for our child who we built from the floor up the floor america or everything trying to break up a family steal our son with the night sky and feed his warmth to a prison or some some other beast, then eat the beast. So we keep our children off the floor by giving them wings. Our children are angels, and tomorrow is a heaven that we built from the floor up. Our love, a God that was always more than the life of us, rests now after the longest revolution. Not out of weariness, but just to stand back and watch tomorrow resting in peace. Just like a new parent. Tomorrow, a black child promised all things broken, but watch them become the presence America was always dying to own. Thank you. Born in Detroit, Poet Ty Himbajess earned his BA from the University of Chicago and his MFA from New York City. He is the author of Lead Belly, 2005, and Olio, 2016. Winner of the Pulitzer Prize, the Midland Society Authors Award in Poetry, and of course, the Annisfield Wolf Book Award. Akave Khanum in, in so you know what, I could, I could do this introduction and we had planned on doing this introduction in this kind of way, but we actually figured that a better way to introduce this brother would be for us to honor him by reading some work from before Olio. So we're gonna perform live uh, some work from Lead Belly in honor of you being here.
when your man comes home from prison. When he comes back like the wound and you are the stitch. When he comes back with pennies in his pocket and prayer fresh on his lips. You got to wash him down first. You got to have the wild weed and tree bark boiled and calm waiting for his skin like a shining baptism back into what he was before gun barrels and bars chewed their claim in his hide and spit him stumbling backwards into screaming sunlight you got to scrub loose the jail time finger smears from ashy skin lather down the cuff marks from ankle and wrist rinse solitary stench loose from his hair Scrape, curse, and confession from the welted and the smooth, the hard and the soft, the furrowed and the lax. You got to hold tight that Shadrach's face between your palms. Take crease and lid and lip and brow and rinse slow with river water. And when he opens his eyes, you tell him calm and sure how a woman birthed him to be whole again. Mr. Haney owned Shreveport's general store where a dollar a week brought my 12-year-old frames lift and lunge of barrel and crate across a sawdust floor. Still, he wanted more. The guitar refused to get naked with Haney. He would fumble up the seams of its, of its hidden croon, hook, clasp, and bodice of each tune mangled down to a stunted strum. So he'd quit. He'd hoist bourbon and order me to hoist song. The velvet locomotive of marrow deep hum. I towed it from a swollen center of guitar. Its catch and slide caught between palms and cradled cross Louisiana. Man, just drum and bass, drum and bass, drum and bass. His bottle and scowl grew louder with each reel and jump that I played while getting paid to show the way of undressing music from its wooden clothes. But it was like coaxing and stone to bathe in sky. He never let his flesh wallow in the blue floating round his earth, so he buried himself deeper in his own dirt. He'd think on the herd a white man can do. Without second thought, he'd slur. Nigga, someday I'm gonna kill you and stagger home. It was there alone in the dark, darkness of me, that I first learned the ways of pure white envy. And thank you, Mr. Haney. Thank you, Mr. Haney. Thank you for teaching me.
when a man comes home from prison. When he comes back like the wound and you are the stitch. When he comes back with pennies in his pocket and prayer fresh on his lips. You got to wash him down. First you got to have the wild wood and tree bark boiled and calmed. Waiting for his skin like a shining baptism. Back into what he was before. Before gun barrels and bars chewed their claim in his hide and spit him. Stumbling backwards into screaming sunlight. You got to scrub loose the jail time finger smears from ashy skin. Lather down the cuff marks from ankle and wrist. Rinse solitary stench loose from the wilted and the smooth, the hard and the soft, the furrowed and the lax. You got to hold tight that Shadrach's face between your palms. Take crease and lid and lip and brow and rinse slow with river water. And when he opens his lies, you got to tell him calm and sure. I would want, want, at want, at want, at want, 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 at want, 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 want to heal the brother like you. Every want, 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 On keyboards, Mr. Eli Haney. My man Jordan on bass. And on drums, the rhythm keeper. Please give it up for Dan Fernandez. Ladies and gentlemen, now coming to the stage with no further ado, please welcome Mr. Taya Hemba. Jess. You know what, one thing I'm definitely gonna come back from this uh, Annisfield Wolf is like, Cleveland know how to throw a party. Y'all yeah. know how, knows how to get down. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I am so honored to be here in this historic venue. Uh, this, this, uh, this, this uh, magnificent ship of theater that's been sailing for 70 plus years through so many black, uh, black theater productions. It's just a, an honor to be here. We're back in the green room thinking about, wow, how many, how many folks have been in, looking in these mirrors and preparing to go on stage like this? It's just, I'm so thrilled to be here and to be here with y'all. So um, thank you for bringing me into this space. Thank you, Annisfield Wolf, especially for bringing me into this space. And thank you, Karen, and happy birthday. What? <laughs> You know? <laughs> so um, I am here to read some poems from that book, Olio, which uh, looks like this. And um, I'm going to commence on doing that with, uh, if y'all are cool with that. Yes? OK, so um, let, me, let me say that um, Olio, the word means a mix of melange of ingredients that come together to form a meal. Okay, uh, in the context of American theater, it is the middle part of the minstrel show, okay, which would be composed of a variety of acts. So it could be a singer, a juggler, a dancer, a contortionist, uh, et cetera, et cetera, coming together to form this oleo in the middle of the minstrel show. And as uh, I'm uh, just to for the edification of those who may not know, the minstrel show was a uh, a principal form of American theater that was born at the, at the beginning of the 19th century, which who, in its main objective was uh, to provide theater for entertainment that made caricatures of African American people. It made, uh, that made two-dimensional depictions of foolishness and, and uh, buffoonery of African American people. And it was really it forms the, the basis of American theater. Now, why do I say that? Because the olio, later on in the 20th century, the parts of the minstrel show kind of dropped off, and olio became what became known as vaudeville, right? And that, that paved the way for the great white way, right? Broadway, right? OK, so um, just like, for instance, first American talking movie, right? 
was called The Jazz Singer, and it was about a minstrel show character with L. Jolson, right? First American talking mo movie, 1927 or so, I think. Anyway, I can get lost in a lot of these, uh, these stories, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you some, some stories from the Olio. And in this book, uh, there are poems that are about the lives of African American creative artists that lived essentially just around the time of the Civil War up until just around the time of World War I, okay? So we're talking about uh, black creative minds that lived uh, through emancipation, past emancipation, and, and up until uh, the in, uh, 1918, 19, 19 or so, okay? And they worked in the, con in, with the, in the context of the minstrel show. Many times, sometimes through the minstrel show, and other times against the context, but always their, their work was being framed by the fact that everything they did was being uh, uh, shadowed by the specter of the minstrel show. Okay? That's a lot of talking. Y'all still with me? I gotta take a pulse. All right? All right? Cool. All right. Just need to see that you're still with me. All right, so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna introduce some of the folks in this, uh, in this, in this book, and I'm gonna start with these folks right here. That is Christine and Millie McCoy. Christine and Millie were sisters. And they are not just standing there uh, back to back, they are actually conjoined twins, okay? So uh, they are conjoined essentially from the bottom of the rib cage all the way through the pelvis. Born in around 1849 in North Carolina, right? Um, question is, uh, they're also the, the longest surviving, what they, they were called Pygopagus twins. That's the name of that particular kind of twinning, Pygopagus twins. Uh, ended up being the longest living Pygopagus twins in history. Now, question for their slave owner, uh, on the plantation of, um, upon which they were born in 1849 is what do I do with Pygopagus twins born on my plantation? How do I make a profit from this product that has been born on my plantation? And a um, further question for them was, well, how do I survive the trials of slavery? And after emancipation, how do I, how do we come together and form a living for ourselves. So I want to create some poems that probe those questions and trace the, the path of their lives, okay? And so this is what I came up with. Let me see here. This is the first example of what I came up with. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna reduce it a little so you can see it in its entirety. And then I'm gonna uh, bring it up a little. So can y'all read that in the back? Okay, fantastic. So what this is, is called a syncopated sonnet. It's, uh, who, who here has heard of a sonnet? S-O-N-N-E-T? Okay, great. We have a lot, of, a lot of poetry people in the house. All right, that's good. For those of you who haven't heard of the sonnet, uh, it's essentially, um, it's a form of po poem that's a few hundred years old. These are Shakespearean sonnets. Right? There's a particular pattern to them. It's A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G, like you're stuttering through the alphabet. Okay? And in this, but in this case, you have two voices speaking separately and together. So if we were to read down the middle of this syncopated sonnet, we would read as such with their conjoined voices. We're fused in blood and body from one thrum stem budding twin blooms of song. We're a double rose grown from hard labor that made our mother shout, spent with all. We hymn to pay soft homage, born of and beyond the flesh. We are just two women singing truths we can't forget. And if we were to just read Millie's side of the equation, We've mended two songs in the one dark skin, bleeding soprano into contralto, descended from raw carnage of the South, bursting open our freedom. We sing past rage to the work song's aria. It leaves us soaked in history like our father's sweat from plantation to grave. Lord, here we are, free twin sisters who've hauled our voices far. Okay? And if we read Christine's side of the equation, 
We ride the wake of each other's rhythm, beating our hearts syncopated tempo with a music all our own, with our mouths seeped in the glow of hand-me-down courage, drenched in spiritual acapellas, flowing soul from bone through skin. We pay debts from broken chattel to circus stars. We sing straight from this nation's barbed-wired heart. Right? So that's uh, what you call an, also an interstitial reading, meaning it's kind of skipping some lines, so to speak. But if we read across, we find their entire story knitted together. So if we were to see, imagine them here speaking together to us, they would read as such. We've mended two songs in one dark skin. We ride the wake of each other's rhythm, bleeding soprano into contralto, beating our hearts syncopated tempo. We're fused in blood and body from one thrum stem budding twin blooms of song. We're double rows descended from raw carnage of the South with a music all our own, with our mouths bursting open our freedom. We sing past rage, seeped in the glow of hand-me-down courage, grown from hard labor that made our mother shout, spent with awe. We hymn to pay soft homage to the work song's aria. It leaves us drenched in spiritual acapellas, soaked in history like our father's sweat, flowing soul from bone through skin. We pay debts born of and beyond the flesh. We are just two women singing truths we can't forget from plantation to grave. Lord, here we are from broken chattel to circus stars, free twin sisters who've heard our voices far. We sing straight from this nation's barbed wired heart. Okay? So, just um, y'all remember the whole sonnet thing, right? So I'm gonna, it's, it's got an ABAB. I'm just going to go through that right quick. So we have skin, right, and contralto, and then stem, and rose, and then south, and rage, and shout, and homage, and us, and sweat, and just, and forget, and are, and far, right? That's A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G, right? And then we have rhythm, tempo, stem, rose, mouths, courage, shout, homage, acapellas, debts, just, that's a soft rhyme, forget, <laughs> and stars and heart, right? So they're true sonnets. Uh, speaking across, across the borders to each other, right? So, um, this is the first uh, poem I wrote in the series. I wanted to say, well, what, what else can I glean from their story? And it comes back to those questions, right? What would slave master do with these conjoined twins born on his plantation? Well, it turns out what their slave master did was, he said, well, they're about 10 months, 11 months old now. I guess they're old enough for me to rent them out to a, uh, to a traveling freak show uh, salesman. And he can take them on the road and take them from town to town, county to county, village to village, and show them off and have them shown for, what, five cents, two cents, three cents a piece, right? A viewing. And that's what I'll do. That's how I will make money from these little babies born on my plantation who are conjoined twins. Other thing about that, however, is every time they went into a new village or a town, there'd be uh, curious physicians that would want to inspect the goods and determine whether or not they were indeed Pygopagus twins or not just two little girls stuck in a dress. So they were uh, uh, subjected to this kind of inspection from village to village, from town to town, from show to show, over and over and over and over and over and over again throughout their bondage to, in, with this slave master and the freak show uh, coordinator. So that happened up until the time that they gained their liberty after emancipation and they got affidavits that proved that they were indeed conjoined twins, and they no longer had to be subjected to that kind of examination. So I wanted to construct a poem that expressed that flow, or that, that, that experience. And uh, let me see, I came up with here. This is that poem. So if we read down the middle, we see their conjoined voices, and we read on the side, we see their separated voices. So, we count the blessings of our double shell as we pay our dues. We've proven ourselves for science. We've been taken town to town like prize bovine. We've been pawed up and down. Each sawbone has searched us from spine to loin. Our wondrous oneness exists. We're conjoined. We're not frauds, but born of providence. God made two souls into one dark skin. <clears throat> but at this point, um, 
I'd like to introduce other ways to encounter the syncopated sonnet because there's a certain plasticity that gives the reader a different kind of agency in encountering this poem. So, why don't we start, say, from here. God bended two souls into one dark skin. We're not frauds, but born of providence. And we've lists of doctors who understand. We've been probed, prodded, and roughly examined from my twin's navel to between her thighs. Been photographed, half nude, verified to those who doubt our form. We have performed with each breath. We prove we've endured face storm. We count the blessings of our doubled shell every time we rise to face the crowd's face on display. We've been richly, rudely paid to prove veracity. They've scared each side and then back up, staring into my eyes from backbone to backbone, from hip to hip. Our miracle is real. Hear and see this. We're not frauds, but born of providence. God mended two souls into one dark skin. We're not frauds, but born of providence. Our wondrous oneness exists. We're conjoined. Each sawbone has searched us from spine to loin, like prize bovine. We've been pawed up and down for science. We've been taken town to town as we pay our dues. We've proven ourselves. We count the blessings of our doubled shell. <laughs> So you might, I, I was also curious about the way, um, well, what, what was the rest of their story? And it turns out, if you are the kind of guy that's going to take a couple of 10 or 11 month old kids and put them on tour, you also might, can y'all hear me in the back? Yeah. 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 You might also might be the kind of guy that would say, you know what? I'm going to keep this money for myself. Why I got to give some money back to this dude in the Carolinas? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these kids, I'm going to put them on a boat, take them over to England, and put them on display and just keep all that ducats for myself, right? That's exactly what happened. So, slave owner, if you are a slave owner, then how do you get your money back, is the question. Well, his answer was this. I'm going to take the mother with me, go on a boat to England, track them down, because they're being advertised all over London, right? Find them, and as soon as these little girls see their mother, what do they do? Mommy, mommy. And that's part of my proof of ownership, right? Now, track them down, identified them, claimed them. But this also proved to be a little bit of a quandary, because this happened in 1851. So. 1851, England. Slavery has been abolished in England. Question for the mother, is there a possibility to sue for one's freedom and stay with uh, one's little girls in England? On the other hand, that would also mean leaving the rest of the family, a husband, and about four or five other kids behind in the Carolinas. What does one do? That's a difficult quandary. This next poem addresses that. Yeah. Millie Christine are kidnapped. Now I'll just start from the bottom. Straight into Dixie's rebellious mouth, a mother left England and went back south. Choosing between homeland and untold harms, we returned to a master we could trust. We went back to bondage in mother's arms. We'd under London court sympathy, and thus, though we'd miss family, were we not blessed? The thief's greed had set us free. Although bonded, we'd been smuggled to freedom's soil, and yes, we'd been stolen from mother and master. Absconded like contraband, we'd been shipped to Britain at the age of three. We'd been kidnapped afar. We'd been rented and sold, then snatched. Taken straight from America's barbed wired heart like double dark treasures. Entertainment imported by a scallywag agent. We, from slavery, we'd, we'd slipped into liberty. Because of our great popularity, we sailed back to our Carolina home, torn between family or freedom's unknowns. Our mother left England and went back south, straight into Dixie's rebellious mouth. Okay? So, sometimes I ask, do I rehearse the way I'm going to go through these lines? No, I don't. It's just impromptu, ad hoc, so to speak. So, the, the reader has the ability to go from any line to any surrounding line, okay? So uh, uh, above it, below it, to the side, etc. right? Um, to 
continue with their story. Now, come back to the, to the Carolinas, and uh, they continue their life in bondage until the end of the Civil War. At the end of the Civil War, the question is, well, what will I, the same question many, every other freed African American had at that time, what am I going to do with my life? How am I going to make some money to support myself? What is this thing <laughs> called freedom, right? How will I exercise it? Well, they decided that the, the best way that they could pursue a livelihood was to continue as freak show exhibits, but of their own volition and without having to be subjected to the same kind of uh, treatment that they'd experienced before. So they did just that. And they toured first around the country, then around the world. They met queens and kings and duchess and dukes, etc. cetera. And uh, they got quite famous, as a matter of fact toured all around the world, and they got, you know, ducats here and pounds here and francs there, and every time they got a little bit of coin, they sent a little bit back home. And little bit, little bit by little, dollar by dollar, they were able to send enough money back home for their parents to buy the plantation upon which they had once been slaves. It's a true story. Not making it up. As a matter of fact, the land stayed in the, in the family for about five generations afterwards, so, so there's some folks still down there right now. And this poem is about that. Let me see. We're free twin sisters who've heard our voices far. We're singing in Drei Sprach und Machen Schwartz. That means roughly in German, we sing in three languages and make them black. We speak more than one tongue wherever we roam. This gives pure gold. While we travel the road with dimes hoarded by pinching francs and pounds against servitude. We sing freedom bound with duets all mingled up to heaven. We bought land that once enslaved our parents with duets all mingled up to heaven from the root of our guts. We give back against servitude. We sing freedom bound for our folks. Thus we buy liberation with dimes hoarded by pinching francs and pounds the Lord provides for us. We make greenbacks. This gives pure gold. While we travel the road, we've made our wealth. For gratification, we speak more than one tongue. We've sung hymns before Queen Victoria. We're singing in Sprach und Machene Schwartz. We melodize worldwide, more than just freaks. We're free twin sisters who've heard our voices far. Yeah. I neglected to say earlier that they were, like, as it says in this, uh, in, in this poem, they did speak th more than one language. They spoke about, spoke about three or four languages. Uh, they could play piano, dance, sing, the whole nine yards. They were real, like, they were real act, you know? They give you a run for the money, <laughs> you know? Um, so uh, they were very, very, very popular. Now, um, this last poem is, uh, is about, just about their love for each other. They did not feel sorry for themselves regarding the form that they came to the planet in. Um, they lived on the planet up until their 60s. Uh, and uh, one died, and then about 18 hours later, the other one followed them, right? Because they had, their circulatory system was uh, severely compromised by the fact that uh, one of them had passed away. But they, uh, they had a, a very prosperous and uh, generous life. Lily Christine's love story. Here, this is our story I want you to hear in unison. Listen to the grace we have. One body crooning two notes. By God, we're like sympathetic strings. Each song sound ringing within me and my other half. Airborne, shook and shimmering through my head in a way, way, way very few could comprehend. With every breath we've got, I'm filled completely so you can see my life is brimmed. It's full. I live each day like I want to see it's night. I love my song and dance and family the way you love your own blood. Twice as much. I've doubled the cause to celebrate life. I love this burden that we've been given to ride the shared wake of one blood's rhythm. I love this burden that we've been given the way you love your own blood. Twice as much. I love my song and dance and family. I live each day like I want to see it's night with every breath we've got. I'm filled completely with souls ablaze. This is how I know love in a way very few could comprehend. So you can see my life is brimmed. It's full with Millie's embracing contrapunto. Airborne, shook and shimmering through my head like sympathetic strings. Each song sound, one body crooning two notes. By God, 
with our own duet. Listen to how we're bound in unison. Listen to the grace we have here. This is our story I want you to hear. <laughs> so, there's a little thing in poetry called a crown of sonnets in which uh, the last line of one poem becomes the first line of the next poem, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I wanted to do that and I failed miserably. <laughs> so I wasn't able to make that happen with this series of poems. But uh, what I was able to do was to uh, borrow a line from, uh, from the first, from that, for every, every, of, every one of the uh, preceding or the other four, four poems borrows a line from this very first poem, such as we mended two songs in the one dark skin, we ride the wake of each other's rhythm, we sing straight from this nation's barbed wired heart, uh, free twin sisters who hold our voices far. So it, there's one of those poems begins or ends one, one of the other four poems that you saw. So that means when you pair them up all together, they end up looking something like that, which enables you this is also uh, an, another poetry term. It's called a concrete poem. In other words, it's a poem that mirrors the subject matter of the poem. So you have here, what? Two heads, conjoined middle, two bases, right? And so the eye of the reader travels across the poem, say, from the top through the middle to the bottom, back up, down, back up, to the other top, down to the middle, whichever way you desire to go, much mirroring the way that the eye of the gazer in the freak show would gaze upon the McCoy twins. But in this case, you're engaging in their story and not just in the uh, form of their physical bodies, okay? So that is a star of syncopated sonnets. And when you buy the book, <laughs> right? you'll find that it, uh, it actually tears out of, the, out of the book, right? And this is, this is how it's printed in the book, right? So you can have them on display, right? Okay, so that is the Star of Syncopated Signs for the McCoy Twins. All right. Thank you. Now I have a little bit more time and I'd like to introduce a couple more people to you, is that cool? Yes. All right, fantastic. So these cats uh, were uh, the comedy duo of the day. If we were living 100 years ago, we'd be like, who's the hot comedy duo of these days? A hot black comedy duo of what? Key and Peele, right? It's funny because it's, like, it's weird. Um, if we were living 100 years ago, then this would be Key and Peele, right? That is Williams and Walker. That's Burt Williams and George Walker. Now, these gentlemen came directly out of the minstrel show. They were, in fact, in minstrel shows. They had their own minstrel show going on. They were very successful at uh, performing in the minstrel show. They, they were born in uh, mid-1870s, uh, started performing in, in the 1880s or so, and really started gain, gaining a lot of attention in the, in the 1890s or so. And um, very successful. Gentlemen, now this, this guy here, uh, uh, that's George Walker, and that's Burt Williams, the taller one's Burt Williams. Uh, George Walker had a cane with like thousands of dollars worth of diamonds on it, right? That's how they dressed when they were not on stage. When they were on stage, they dressed in blackface. Right uh, now, the the thing about them in the in the minstrel tradition is that they uh, were interested in moving through the minstrel tradition and creating not just caricatures or two dimensional and flat depictions of African Americans, but in characters that had depth. So not just to make you laugh, but also to make you cry. Right which is actually what W.C. Fields said about them, is that it was the fact that they could make you laugh and make you cry, right? Um, so they, they were actually in, uh, responsible for some of the very first independent black theater productions in the United States, right? So they, uh, they were attempting to move from caricature, caricature to character, 
right? That's important because I want to, I'm, that'll come, back, come up later, okay? And what I want to show you here right now is another exhibit from the days of minstrelsy. And this, this is, I did not write this, but that is the actual title of the book, The Whitmark Amateur Minstrel Guide and Burnt Cork Encyclopedia, right? Which is published around 1905. And I bring this here because it's on the back of the poem that I am about to show you, okay? And I include this in the book because it's important for people to see how, how prolific the influence of the minstrel show was in American culture, right? How, how easily it was uh, proliferated throughout uh, the average American home. So these are just kind of a guide on how to put, put a minstrel show together for your, for your neighborhood or for maybe for your elementary school, right? Or maybe for your Lions Club or whatever, right? And it's full of uh, all kinds of important instructions like how to black up, right? How to get champagne, uh, champagne cork and, and burn it up and, and then mix the ashes with grease and put it all over your face, et cetera, right? And also, it's, it's, it, it goes on for like something like 90 odd pages. I just got an excerpt here because I need to show the public how pervasive this is. And as, as it has been the aim of the writer to provide for the young, oh, there's one, one, one quote I like to bring from here. It says, um, it affords vocalists a chance to come out in solo or concerted work and the young, uh, and the young comedians or dancers excellent opportunities to shine forth and give full vent to their humor and wit. Minstrelsy, it says here, is the one American form of amusement purely our own. And it has lived and thrived even though the plantation darky who gave it, first gave it a character has departed, right? Okay. So, now I'm gonna introduce you to these guys right here. Yeah, where they go? This is the Burt Williams George Walker Paradox. Can everybody read that? From the back, let me make it a little bigger. Oh, that's a little too big. Okay, can everybody read that? Great. Burt Williams' George Walker Paradox. Now, what we have here is another form of poem called a chazal, okay? It's an Indo-Arabic form, G-H-A-Z-A-L. It's roughly a thousand years old. It started off mostly as song, right? And it's really about uh, a declaration of self, and it's also, um, it's also rooted in, in a kind of yearning, so to speak, all right? Um, so there's a couple rules to a hustle. One is that every other line, there is a word or a phrase that is repeated, okay? In this case, you have this word, nobody, right? Nobody, 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 right? See that? And on the, on the other side, you have uh, face, 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 right? Okay? It's about 30, 30 lines or 15 uh, stanzas long, right? And um, 13 syllables a line in this case, right? What I like to do is uh, like for you to imagine Burt Williams and George Walker standing up next to each other, right? And uh, having this exchange, like stand-up comedians. Okay, ready? So I'm gonna read through this, and we're gonna see how it reads. Is that cool? Okay, great, here we go. Let me take a little. Sing like me, Jonah in the charcoal hold of the whale. Be smiling till the crowd starts to cry. This nobody just might be playing you for a fool. You see this face, be smiling till the crowd starts to cry. This nobody got them laughing loud like me. You think they mock my face? Can't help but see themselves just beneath my blacked up face, wondering about dark's pathos. Believe the human get in touch from inside out. Every wide-eyed face in the crowd all gut bent with laughter. They know that they will be baptized clean. I want to make it so each face will be baptized clean. I want to make it so each face remember my tale. Not hopeless but lonely. One full of fret about humanity. It's masked on my face atop a dancing darkness shining hard. No, I'm not getting blistered with spotlight. That's my mask, not my face getting blistered with spotlight. That's my mask, not my face making folk double take what they see. I'm the straight man, bent enough to snicker itself, or in white folks' faces crooning while coon songs paint my strife. 
They claim nobody crooning my coon songs paint my stripes. They claim nobody yearning for tragic Negro to uplift them, to buck filled with black magic. Don't tell me that ain't nobody filled with black magic. Don't tell me that ain't nobody teary when I'm on a losing car game. I want them all grinned up. I stay sharp or I can't get nobody all grinned up. I stay sharp or I can't get nobody rolling in aisles each time. Have you seen their faces beyond the skin? Here in my show, they are me. They'll be themselves. See, most crowds know nothing about nobody trying to rise up the race. We're two real coons proud of trying to rise up the race. We're two real coons proud of spitting black high-class grace from all the bile been swallowed rising through blackface. Some claim how we ain't nobody when we sophisticated Sambo's lot. We're that face being sitting here to ponder on pride, but we sweat coal being sitting here to ponder on pride, but we sweat coal pushing past Zip Coon. We'll make theater about face, pushing past Zip Coon. We'll make theater about face, making theater about us. Plays of paradox telling real human comedies. That's us. Nobody slowly erasing Dockety Dawn a human face telling real human comedies. That's us. Nobody doing the work we're born to do. See, we want to be working with a truth that smothers Jim Crow stench. We are free. We wake up to mirrors full of slick black faces, dead set to swagger into undeferred dream. Look, we're wise to the dark's risk. I'll shine the crowd. I have each face sure of the price. What are acts worth? Bet you nobody wise to the dark's risk. I'll shine the crowd. I have each face dead set to swagger into undeferred dream. Look, we're free. We wake up to mirrors full of slick black faces doing the work we're born to do. See, we want to be doing the work we're born to do. See, we want to be telling real human comedies. That's us. Nobody slowly erasing dark in the dawn of human face, closing the curtain on coon shows. That is our mission. Mine and joy out of hurt. That's better than nobody mine and joy out of hurt. That's better than nobody changing the game a bit. We've made ourselves somebody's being sitting here to ponder on pied. But we've sweat cold when we've sophisticated Sambo's lot. We're that face rising through blackface. Some claim how we ain't nobody shining back, spitting back high class grace from all the bile been swallowed, trying to rise up the race. We're two real coons proud of living neath Quark's costume. My crowds got to face this face themselves. See, most crowds know nothing about nobody beyond the skin. Here in my show, they are me. They'll be rolling in aisles each time. Have you seen their faces? Red with laughter when I crack wise. That's how I get them tickled with slapstick black. I color each white face gone corrupt with comedy. That's the ticket I sell. Gone corrupt with comedy. That's the ticket I sell. Yearning for tragic Negro to uplift them to buck filled with black magic. Don't tell me that ain't nobody gone corrupt with comedy. That's the ticket I sell. Bent enough to snicker itself or in white folks' faces. Crooning my coon songs, paint my strife. They claim nobody making folk double take what they see. I'm the straight man making folk double take what they see. Getting, I'm the straight man getting blistered with spotlight. That's my mask, not my face speaking low of my woe. Little fame don't hurt nobody full of bulging eyes, cake walking long to ragtime full of fret about humanity. It's masks on my face, birth to sing fresh out of pain. I sang like nobody remembering my tale. Not hopeless, but lonely. One teared up in titters, then torn down sad. A soiled soul remembering my tale, not hopeless but lonely. One knuckled under humor. Who escapes it? Nobody. Holding secret smiles for another man's plight. A shame in the crowd, I'll gup it with laughter. They know that they being buried neath my ash. Don't claim that nobody, don't claim that nobody being swept up in my diamond studs strut. Bless those that might be saying, look at that handsome man. Nobody might be saying, look at that handsome man. Nobody born to riddle all about race. I sure bet nobody just might be playing you for a fool. You see, this face just might be playing you for a fool. You see, this face be smiling till the crowd starts to cry. This nobody sing like me. Jonah in the charcoal hold of the whale, doing justice to my juba, juba dance. See how I, it's juba jig, see how I dance? Doing justice to my juba jig. See how I dance? Doing justice to my juba jig. See how I dance? Thank you.
Now I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go through this, this, one last, uh, this one last iteration of the poem. When you buy the book <laughs> and uh, tear the poem out of the book, because it's so well perforated, it just slips out of the book like that. You'll find that when you cut along the dotted edge of each poem, right, of the poem, you'll find here's the poem, and then on the back of the poem there's the rules, right, from the, uh, from the uh, Court Encyclopedia, right? So, what you have here is a, an x-y axis, right? That's where you traditionally encounter the page on, the poem on the page. x, y, right? And there's two dimensions, right? In this case, however, this side of the poem reads into this side of the poem, and this side of the poem reads into that side of the poem. It goes around and around, right? Also, the top and the bottom read into each other. So why not just bring them together as such? In this case, you have a two-dimensional uh, form that's turned into what? Something with that cylinder, right? That also happens on the other on the other end. You have another cylinder formed here, right? So you're going from a two-dimensional form to a three-dimensional form. When you do both of them at the same time, right? Back right. then. Then you have what is known as a torus, which reads around and around on the inside, on the outside, and also through each side. Woo! Right? So, one last thing. This is a, there's a lot of contradictions. When you read it one way, it means that it's one thing. When you read it back the other way, it kind of erases that. So it's an exercise in contradiction, right? And that, that's kind of a paradox. It was a paradox, but a half twist with a mobile script. Yeah. It reads over and over, from side to side, back, back and forth, over and over and over and over again, right? But that's what they were trying to do, isn't it? Isn't what they were trying to do is to deconstruct the given history of the books that they had been given, right? And deconstruct and swallow the rules of the minstrel show and, and, and twist them into their own, into tools that would make their own magic scene, right? Isn't that what they were trying to do? When they were trying to build three-dimensional characters out of the rot of the minstrel show? And that's, what, that's what this is trying to do at the same time. And um, that's what I hope that y'all will do <laughs> with whatever it is that you encounter in all the kind of, uh, all the kind of <laughs> received literature and the received stories that we, that we encounter in our lives. With all the kind of, uh, kind of ways that black folks, black folks have to take the history that we have and then understand it for, for the context that it lies in and then reinterpret it so that it actually serves our, our best purposes. That's what, that's what we're about, right? Isn't that the best thing that a poem can do for us? That's what we're trying to do. So hopefully, y'all going to buy the book. <laughs> All right. So I want to say once again, thank you, Ernest Phil Wolf. It's such an honor to be up in here with y'all. Cleveland in the house. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please continue your applause for Miss Lydia Monell of Bruise and Prose. Let's just uh, keep the round of applause going, though. Brews and Prose has spent five years at Market Garden Brewery, and in that time, our tongue-in-cheek slogan has always been, literature is better with beer. <laughs> but as five years of partnership with the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards have demonstrated, literature is also better in boxing rings, cathedrals, museums, former synagogues, and this year, here at the historic Caramu House. <laughs> We are thrilled to partner tonight with your talented MC, Daniel Gray Contar. Let's give him a hand. Yeah. 
and 12 Literary and Performing Arts Incubator. We owe a debt to Stephanie Thompson at the Cleveland Foundation and to Asila Sharif and our generous hosts here at Caramu House. But when I took over Brews and Pros this summer, one of the first people to greet me was Karen Long. And when you attend her events, like last night's sold out Annisfield Wolf Award ceremony, you feel the same spirit of generosity. Tonight and every night of Cleveland Book Week, we owe Karen a debt of gratitude. All right, come see Brews and Pros next month at Market Garden Brewery, where on Tuesday, October 3rd, we'll host Ted Genoways and Eleanor Henderson. And if you like what we do, consider our GoFundMe campaign, which will allow us to continue to bring writers like Terrence Hayes, Connie Schultz, Linda Gregerson, Chigozi Obioma, Celeste Ng, and Akron's own A. Van Jordan and Rita Dove. Mr. Jess will be signing books in the room at the back of the theater, and the books will be sold by our friends at Max Bax. While you're waiting, enjoy music from DJ Candy Fresca and pick up some information about all the brilliant writers featured during Cleveland Book Week. Another round of applause for Daniel Gray Contar, our host at Caramu House, and for 2017 Annisfield Wolf Award winner, Tyamba Jess. <laughs> 